Head back to your seat. If you're spending time with the Lord, you spend time with the Lord. We're not going to rush that at all. That's a bunch of young people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Those of you that are at your seats, you can be seated in the Lord's presence. I'm going to get into the word of the Lord for a few moments tonight. I want to invite you in house and online to the book of 1 Peter chapter 4 for Seriously, just a few minutes tonight, we could go a long ways in this particular part of the message. And again, I'm going to be dealing with what the glory of God produces in our life, but this is not going to seem like a glory of God message. Does that make sense? Are you okay with that? But it clearly is because the context clearly denotes it to be that. But I want to show you tonight that sometimes... The glory of God produces things in our life that change us and convict us so deeply that we would rather it not be one of the productions in our life, if that makes sense. There are some things that we would rather just avoid. And how many you know that we spend far too much of our life being wasted trying to avoid the things that would actually get us to the next level that we've been praying about? And I know a lot of people, and I pastor a lot of people, and I deal and counsel and help and run through deliverance a lot of people that are praying for the power and the glory of God. But then when the Lord puts something in their life that's going to lead them on the journeying path to the power and the glory of God, they then throw on the Jake brakes and say, that, that's not what I meant. I, I want the power, but I don't want the process. I want the glory of the resurrection, but I don't want the spit and the beating of the crucifixion. But you will never go up until you first go down. You will never get until you first give. You will never live until you learn to die. That's a principle of the Bible. And so in the Word of God from 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to jump right in to verse number 12. And I want you to circle and I want you to see that very first word because he's reminding us under Holy Ghost inspiration, who he's talking to, and it's not lost people. He says, beloved. Say that with me. Here we go. Beloved. Say it again. Beloved. We are the beloved of God. God loves us. He has mercy on us. He has forgiven us. He cherishes us. God Almighty calls us on a number of occasions throughout the continuity of the New Testament, beloved. That's an important word because what he's going to say doesn't seem too loving. But how many of you know that a good father knows how to administer the right discipline at the right time? And every one of your children cannot be disciplined in the same way. They're different. Some of them, you could, you could use a boat oar. And they would still be disrespectful. Other ones, you could just cut the look and boom, they're done for the next 20 years. They're great. God knows how to administer certain things in your life. And let me just say this. There is a principle of chastening in the Bible when we are not living right. That's not what I'm preaching on tonight. Because all trials and problems in your life are not the chastening hand of God. Sometimes it's God chasing you down so that you can be pruned and you can come forth pure as gold. Here's what Job said. When he have tried me, Job 13, 15, I shall come forth as gold. But you have to be tried in order for the gold to come forth. That makes sense? Say hallelujah. Now let me also say this before I read the rest of the passage. Not everything you face in life is a demon. Please say amen. Not everything can be blamed on the demon. Sometimes God allows things in your life, and sometimes God allows the demonic in your life, Ask Job. You see, there is a devil, but he's God's devil, and like a dog on a leash, he barks and bites when God says he can, and that's it. And the devil can't touch you unless God gives him permission, and he only gives him permission so that he can grow you, not destroy you. So he says, Beloved, think it not strange... By that he means don't be confused. 
Don't be angry. Don't be mad. Don't get sideways. Don't get cattywampus and imbalanced. Beloved, think it not strange concerning, please watch the next phrase, the fiery trial which perhaps, no, 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 which is to try you. The great prince of preachers, C.H. Spurgeon of the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle in London, said it correctly when he said, when it comes to trials, here's three things you can understand. You're either in one, you've just come out of one, or you're getting ready to walk into one. As the sparks fly upward, Job said, so is man that is born of a woman. He is filled with trouble. You're going to have problems in life. You're going to have trials in life. You're going to have persecution in life. Matter of fact, the Bible says that you can count on the fact that if you live godly, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you never suffer persecution, know this, the Bible says it's because you're not living godly. Godly. If you live godly, there will be a target on your back, if not a target on your face, and it's not always a bad thing. It's proof that you are walking in connection to the Holy Spirit. Because if you and I, all of us, top down, if we are going to bear more fruit, John 15, and much fruit, he's going to have to trim us back. He's going to have to purge out what needs to be purged out. He's going to have to get us to change the wine skin because what you're praying for cannot be contained in what you're carrying right now. You've got to be different. And notice what he does to make us different. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, when you talk to Christians, they're like, well, my goodness, I don't know why I'm having car trouble. My goodness, I don't know why I'm having marital trouble. My goodness, I don't know why the doctor said I got cancer. My goodness, I don't know why I'm having financial instability. He said, do not sit around shrugging your shoulders, wondering why it happened. It happened because the Bible says there's going to be a trial that's going to test you. You see, it's not fun, but here's the context that you need to sink your teeth into and wrap your theological hands around tonight, and that is this. A faith that is never tested cannot be trusted. Did you hear me? A faith that is never tested cannot be trusted. And all throughout the Bible, think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was a fiery trial that proved who they were and ultimately who their God was and changed the trajectory of an entire nation. We're talking about it 4,000 years later. And so in this context, he says, listen, don't sit around shrugging your shoulders wondering, why is this happening to me? You see, we ask this question all the time. Why me? Why me? Why me? Why not ask the question, why not you? Why not you? Why not me? Why not your marriage? Why not your kid? Why not your health? Why not your finances? Because the why me turns into a whining me. Oh, I tell you, nobody else is going through this. Yeah, they are if they're living godly. He said, do not think it's strange. You're going to have trials. You're going to have people that walk away from your life. There's going to be things that happen you don't understand. You are going to face a fiery trial. So the question isn't, Am I going to face it? The question is, what are you going to do and how are you going to react when you face it? Now, let me say this. I don't want to oversimplify the facts, but I'm going to. Your problem is not your problem. How you respond to your problem is the depth of your real problem. Because he said, do not think it strange. Now, look. I've heard people say all this bunch of voodoo nonsense. Well, don't preach on trials because you'll force people to go through them. Don't word curse yourself. That's nonsense. If God wants you to go through a trial, you'll go through a trial. I ain't a voodoo witch doctor. I'm a Bible preacher. And there's eventually a time in the Bible as a preacher that you've got to get to a verse that people don't like. And God said, here's the one you don't like. There is a fiery trial that's going to try your faith. And guess what? You will find out if you have faith and what you are made of when the fiery trial comes into your life. Now, I want to I show you a, a simple example. Crazy how things come to me. I was eating noodles in my house last night. 
And I'm a noodle nut, amen. And I said, honey, you ain't going to believe this. I said, right now while I'm eating, and it was this, this special made-up recipe, but she, made, she pulled it off like Betty Crocker. And I said, honey, you ain't going to believe. God just gave me a message while I was eating noodles. And it wasn't even about noodles, right? It was about the silverware that I was eating the noodles with. Because in actuality, it wasn't silverware. Although it looks extraordinarily like silverware. It's plasticware. It's Q plasticware. Now, it, it's a miracle of God we even have the metal stuff in our house, right? We have very little of it. Uh, so I, I don't want to thwart my illustration before I go too far. But I, I rarely ever eat with these things. I don't know what it is. I guess it's the fillings in my teeth. It makes it feel like an antenna's in my mouth. And I'm like, have a radio going off in my brain. I can't stand metal forks. Everywhere I go, I'm like, uh, can I have plasticware? They're like, that's strange. I'm like, I'm a paying customer. I, customer, I need some plasticware. Okay, can I, can I have the to-go stuff? Everywhere I go, I don't eat with metal. I eat with plasticware. That's a whole other message. If you think that's weird, get your own microphone on Wednesday night. But nonetheless, <laughs> there is a physical difference between these two forks that I hold in my hand, although they have the same responsibility at the end of the day. But let me tell you a couple of things about these forks, all right? This fork right here, the one that's actually, whatever you call that, aluminum, I don't know what it is, metal. This fork right here, if I were to bend it, that is exactly what it would do. It would bend and give and stretch and gymnastic and bend and give and stretch. It would bend all the way into a circle if I so desired it to. But this one would not even get halfway into a circle. Because, see, the difference in someone that is real and someone that is plastic is that real people will bend with the pressure. Fake people will snap. with the pressure because when you apply an extra amount of pressure to a real piece of silverware it will give with the pressure and it will bend with the pressure but when you take plastic wear and you try to apply too much pressure even with a couple of fingers I could very easily rather than bend it, I would snap it because it will break beneath the pressure. And your faith is tested as to whether you bend with God or you break when he allows something to come into your life. But that wasn't the message that the Lord gave me. The message the Lord gave me was, and I'm not necessarily going to do this up here because I don't want to Set the whole building on fire, praise God. The haters would like that. You want to help me out, babe? You, you got you, you the water in person. Okay, I'll tell you what. Hold the mic for me. That's all good. I, I, I'm not going to use it, but... Whoop. All right. Now, let me tell you something about these two forks. It's interesting what happens if you were to put heat on these two forks. Hmm? So listen, if you took the real one, ting, 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 and you put fire on it, I can hold that flame on this fork for an extraordinarily long time until eventually the handle gets so hot I have to drop it. Because when you heat up something that's real and you add flame to it, it only gets hotter. Did you hear me? When you heat up something real, it intensifies in its heat level. But when you heat up something that's fake, it does not intensify. It burns up. Hmm? It melts. It disintegrates. I remember when I was a kid, I used to burn my little G.I. Joe guys, that stuff. Ah, stuff would follow me. <laughs> Dip that in there, babe. So, I guess I don't need that either. So, the point is, 
that far too often when God heats supposed believers up, they don't get hotter. They disintegrate. Marriage falls apart. They blame the church, blame the pastor, bl blame the worship team, bl blame, the, bl blame people that they used to love, right? And all of a sudden, they're out of church, and it's everybody else's fault. That They're broke as a joke, and they wonder why it's, you know, their fault. They would never take accountability or personal responsibility, but they don't look in the mirror and realize, you know what? Maybe God's just heating me up a little bit. Because if God heats you up, when the fiery trial tries you, if you're real, it'll heat you up. But if you're fake, it'll burn you out. Think of all the plastic people you've spent decades on that melted away like manna in the noonday sunshine. Fair-weathered friends like Job had. People that you have spent your life investing in and in this moment in the history of the narrative of who they are, they would not spit on you if you caught fire in their living room because you wouldn't be allowed in their living room. Think about that. Think about the people that claim, I've got something, I've got something. Really? Well, let God take away something from you and see how hot you get. When God puts you in the fiery trial, you are either going to accentuate and you're going to balance out that heat because heat produces more heat because you're real or you are going to melt and stink and disintegrate and drip all over everybody that never hurt you to begin with. So whether we recognize that or not, there are people in this room, both of those forks are in this room tonight. 100%. I don't know what the percentage is, nor do I care. God knows the percentage because when he cranks up the heat, you're either going to get hotter for Jesus or you're going to melt away. That's why in the last days, the love of many will wax cold. You know why? Because they're going to just melt away. They're not going to be able to handle the heat. They're not going to be able to handle the pressure. They're just not going to be able to handle it. But listen, I'm trying to groom you and grow you and mature you into an army of believers that do not care how much fire and hell you have to walk through. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That doesn't mean they will not come against the church. They will come against us, but they won't win. Somebody told me today, said, did you have to wear the most offensive shirt that you could possibly find? Don't you think that puts a target on your back? Yeah, that's why I put it on the front. Because I ain't scared of that crowd. I ain't backing down for that crowd. Right? I, listen, the trials are on their way. The, the financial hardship in this nation hasn't even begun yet, and some of y'all already broke. It's going to get bad. It is not going to get any better. I promise. It's not. Okay? I don't care about all this little, well, you know, just tell me something sweet. Tell me something kind. Prophesy double for my trouble. Okay? You're going to get double for your trouble once you get through the tribulation and you get to heaven. Okay? I'm telling you, fiery trials are coming. I'm so tired of people thinking that just because you prayed and signed a card and got in the baptismal waters and you walked an aisle and joined a small group that you're supposed to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You never have trouble. You never have inconsistencies. You never have problems. You never have financial instabilities. You never get sick. Nothing ever happens to you. You're perfect. You're always wise. You always make the right decisions. I'm thinking, what Bible are you reading? Are you, are you kidding me? We've got this utopian society where pastors are better yoga instructors than they are Bible teachers. Well, just cross your legs and just... Mm. You can cross your legs and hum all you want to, but you're about to go through some hell. Persecution's about to hit this nation like never before. It's the facts. And if i got to thin the whole crowd out and preach to five of you, it's still the facts. It's the facts. And the Bible says, when the fire comes, you're one of two people. It creates something in you that makes you burn hotter. 
or it just discourages you to the point where you just melt away and get burned up. And when you say you're a Christian, if you ever even say it, most people snicker and laugh at you because there's no effects or fruit in your life that would prove that. Jesus said, they draw near to me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. That's the American church that there ever has been. We talk a big game when it comes to the things of God, but let some trials creep into your life. Let a hospital visit creep into your life. Let a death creep into your life. Let some bereavement creep into your life. Let some problems with your kids creep into your life. Let, let, the, let the doctor tell you that word that you don't want to hear. You know, all of a sudden, maybe you get a, a pink slip in the mail from somewhere you worked for 20 years. You let some trials show up, and you'll find out who people are and what they're made of. Now look, it's not something I'm longing for, not something I'm looking for, not something I'm trying to sign up for, but when you get saved, you're already signed up for it. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. It's going to happen. That's why, by the way, if you are not faithfully connected to a local New Testament church, you will not make it because you've got to have some family that can fight hell with you when it comes at you. You know why people melt away? Because they get mad at the church and they sit in their living room their whole life and think they can handle it. You cannot handle trials by yourself. You are not built to be burnt by yourself. Find some people that will burn with you. Find you a couple of friends that will jump in a furnace when Nebuchadnezzar says you better worship another god. Find you some crazy people that will burn with you when you burn. Am I making sense? All right, verse 13. Them forks got me tore up. But watch this. Rejoice. Don't cry. Don't complain. Don't cuss. Don't fuss. Don't get out of church. Don't get on Facebook and just, you know, oh, uh, oh my goodness. They ought to call it, call it vomit book. I'm like, is this person ever happy? Does this person, do they wake up? thinking of how they can rebuke everyone but themselves. If the people that posted on Facebook would hate their own sin as much as they hate everybody else's, Facebook would be a pleasant place to dwell. It's such a cesspool of nonsense and narcissism. It's crazy. And, and everybody's on there, you know, bemoaning, groaning, griping. I'm like, come on, Rejoice. If God never does another thing for you, he's done enough already. You ought to be in hell with a broke back. He says rejoice. Watch this. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. Now think about that. Why should I not stop when the fire gets hot? Because if Jesus would have stopped when the fire got hot, you'd die in your sin. He showed us how to suffer well. He showed us how to be persecuted well. We are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Watch this. That, here we are, here we are. when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding what? Joy. Not complaining, not madness, not blaming everybody, not the blame game. No, no, no. Exceeding joy. So let me say this. According to this verse and the next one, what does the glory of God produce in our life? Suffering. Difficulty. Call it what you want to. If you think you're going to walk around in the heaviness of the glory of God and people aren't going to persecute you, your flesh isn't going to buck and rebel against that, and the enemy's not going to come against you. If you think you're going to leave this life without any problems, you are sickly mistaken. And, and there are people, by and large, that have this idea, well, if you walk with God, you'll never have so much as a headache. Are you kidding me? You'll never have financial instabilities. There'll never be problems. You'll, you'll, you'll never have anything at all in life that will ever bother you. Okay, sirrah, sirrah. And I'm like... Do you hear yourself when you talk? H have you looked at the underground church in China tonight? We think we're so special, like America's got some kind of make-believe covenant with God. There's only one nation that's got a covenant with God, and it's the nation of Israel, not the nation of the United States. And we think, well, you know, we're special Christians. We should never suffer persecution. Tell that to people tonight in Korea. 
Tell that to the 1,000. By the way, that's how many there are. To the 1,000 Christians that are in Gaza with 1.3 million Islamic individuals. Well, you know, your God don't want you to suffer. He just wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Stop. Shut that nonsense up. That is heresy. That's why I'm, and listen, I said it on this past weekend, and I might lose four or five people, but we got a few religious people. We need to get going anyhow. That's why I'm sick of this false theology that I preach for a long time. Well, you know, it doesn't matter how bad it gets. God's just going to snatch us up out of here. He's going to kidnap us away. Why didn't he kidnap the people during the martyrs' days when they were burning people at the stake and ripping their tongues out? Are we better than they are? Are we some kind of better Christian? I say not. We're way worse than that crowd was. Well, you know, God's just going to snatch me out of here. I don't have to suffer persecution. And the heat's going to get so hot, you're going to melt because when the persecution shows up, some preacher told you not to be ready for it because you wasn't going to have to deal with it, but you're going to deal with it. So you better, I wouldn't pack my bags too quick because you ain't going nowhere. Unless you die, God forbid that happens. But that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Matter of fact, think about this. Uh, I didn't even tell you this, Brother John. Uh, me and John, a couple weeks ago, I don't know, a couple months ago, I guess, a month ago, we went to uh, Houston, about, about a month ago, I guess, in one. And I'd been down there preaching in uh, Columbia with Pastor Michael Petro, good man of God. And he's the pastor at that at Healing Church, the Voice of Healing. And uh, he, he, he ran the ministry. And just yesterday, just, he dropped in. We was just with him. Great man of God. Went out to dinner with him, had milkshakes. Wonderful man of God. Got us connected to Israel. Just walked, got up, walked around. Ha- Fell over dead of heart attack. Just a dear man of God, dear friend. So look, you're going to die. You will not escape this life still living. You just not. Death and taxes, as the old timers say. You pay them both of them. Mm, you pay them both of them. And they feel about the same these days. But listen, trials are it's part of life. Nobody wants to hear that. Everybody likes cute sermons, right? Preach on deliverance. I am right now. Some of you need to be delivered from the arrogance of thinking that you're never going to have any problems. Because you're going to have some. And look, you know what he says right here? In in, in so many words, I I know the King James says, Ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. Let uh, Let me, Greg, lock that up for you without messing it up. It means when all that garbage happens in your life, please keep a smile on your face. You see, we can tell that some of you don't really walk with God, although you pretend to say you do, because you look like you've been baptized in pickle juice and sucking on a PVC pipe full of rotten lemonade. I love Jesus. Dear God, tell your face. Are you kidding me? Man, I'm I'm getting too old for them games. He that hath friends must show himself friendly. People say, I'll tell you one thing. Nobody ever hugs me at church. When you walk around like an orangutan. No wonder. You got to throw your arms up. You want some smiles? Give some smiles. You want some love? Give some love. You want a fist bump? Give a fist bump. You want some hugs? Give some hugs. You want some understanding? Start doing some understanding. And we got people walking around mad at God. But look like they mad at everybody. You see, look, I, I preached on this a while back, just not even here. I don't even remember where I was. But I, I, I didn't preach a whole sermon on it, but it was just a little thought that I had. Because, look, here, here's where a lot of people get messed up. You know, we get deliverance ministry. We're like, oh, forgive you, Daddy. Forgive you, Mama. Forgive all these people. You know, forgive your molester. Forgive your this. Forgive you that. Forgive your ex-husband. Forgive your ex-wife. That's cute. And that's good. And you should. And then we say, you know, make sure you forgive yourself. Let me tell you what some of you need to do. Are you ready for this? I want everybody to do this right here. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Hold up. Let me tell you what some of you need to do. Some of you need to forgive God. You say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Mr. Heretic. No, 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 wait a minute. Some of y'all are so mad that God did something in your life that you didn't ask for and you didn't appreciate that your bitterness isn't towards anybody but God. And you need to say, God, I am so sorry I treated you that way. And there's a lot of people that will stay in bondage because they can forgive everybody but what God allowed in their life. Okay, let me say something before I keep reading. 
Did you know, and, and we could turn this whole thing into a series and we may do it. Did you know that trials, and look, I'm not wishing, wishing them on anybody. I don't want sickness. I don't want to see death. I don't want to see bereavement. I don't want to see you struggle. I don't want to see none of that. But it's, it's, it's reality of life. It happens. But let me tell you something about trials. Trials is the one area that we don't understand in regards to the context of stewardship. Did you know that even trials are a stewardship from the Lord? Let, let that sink in. Marinate in that for a minute. Trials, affliction, the fiery trial and persecution he just mentions multiple times that we should be joyous about is a stewardship from God. Here's why. Do you know why some of you, some of us, have to go through certain things that other people never have to walk through? I'm going to tell you why. Because God can trust you with it, but he can't trust them with it. Because if God put it on them, they'd bend and break and get mad and quit reading their Bible and get out of church and leave their spouse and kick their cat and their dog and their kids and they'd get mad and be all upset and crotchety faced all the time. Listen, the reason God allows you to go through some of the things you're going through is because you've already proven yourself to be trustworthy in the previous trial and five years ago, what you thought was gonna kill you is like a blip on the radar today. Listen, there was things that happened to me in the last 10 years. I thought, it's going to kill me. It's going to kill me. It's going to kill me. And I look back now and I'm like, I don't even know why I broke a sweat over that. Because what's coming next is going to be a thousand times worse. And I'm going to be like, oh, it's going to kill me. It's going to kill me. And then 10 years I'm going to be like, that was stupid. He whine about that. Why? Because the more you grow, the hotter you burn and the less that hurts you. God entrusts you with things that he can't entrust other people with. Let me tell you something. You ever heard somebody say, and I do not say this as a pastor. I learned my lesson years ago because it's a lie. There's a lot of pastors that tell this lie. Oh, I, I know what you're going through. Don't ever say that to somebody if you don't. Okay, if, if somebody's spouse just died and they come to me for counsel and prayer, I'm going to counsel, I'm going to pray. But I am not going to say, oh, dear brother, dear sister, I know what you're going through. No, I don't. I don't, I don't want to. Years ago, when we were in the little chapel, I mean, like early in the days, just in the wedding chapel, we had a lady that uh, miscarried a baby. And, of course, you know, the family was devastated, and I showed up at the house, and I was praying for them, and, and, or at the hospital, rather, and I was praying for them. And it was just, it was a devastating time. But I remember about a year later, and this family state they actually moved away. They, they left on great terms, still good people. But about a year later, year and a half, not quite two years later, another lady reached out. She was just visiting. And she said, Pastor Locke, my husband and I just recently lost a child. And she said, I, I, I just I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to process it. Now, I could have said, oh, I, I, I know what you're going through. Let's, let's pray right now. But I didn't. You know what I said? I said, you know what? I don't understand the grief that you're experiencing right now, but we have a lady in our church that does. And if I could give you her number, and it changed that woman's life because it changed her perspective. You see, God allows you to face certain things, not just so you can be better, but that everybody that's coming up behind you can be better. Because God will never waste your trial. He will never waste your affliction. He will never waste your hurt. He will never waste your tears. And he will never waste your sleepless nights, ever. Ever. Your tears are recorded by God in a book. And God knows every one of them that you've cried. Every one of them. So he said, look, keep a smile on your face. Stay happy. Exceeding happy, he says. Watch this, verse 14. For if ye be reproached, and we're all going to be reproached, there's, there's different levels of trials, persecution, right? But watch what he's going to do here. This is beautiful. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, okay, if people reproach you because you're a Christian, and if you're a real Christian, right, right if, you're, if you're bending and not, you know, burning up and melting, if, if you're the real deal, if you're not plastic... If you're a real Christian, guess what? People are going to come against you. But when they do, here's what he says. Happy are ye. Why? For the spirit of, what's that word? Glory. The spirit of the glory of God resteth upon you. 
You know, there's been times in my life that the most spiritual I've ever been is in times when I've been to the biggest trial. And the spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. But watch this. On their part, the people trashing you for your faith in God, on their part, he, God, is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. So, so people are trashing you and reproaching you and persecuting you for the cause of Christ and for your testimony and for faith. So on their part, he's evil spoken of. But what the enemy means for evil, God means for good because you just turn around and say, glory to God. And that burns their biscuits. They can't handle it. The Bible says you'll heat coals of fire on their head. There'll come a point that you'll make them so mad that when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him because your enemies decide to come over on your side because they're tired of being mad at you because they're looking at you getting blessed by God and all these problems are happening in your life and you still lifting your hands saying, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sin not, nor charge God foolishly. It is foolish to raise your hand to God and say, I can't believe you're allowing this in my life. Foolish. Foolish. I was out riding the other day and I was listening to the book of Job in my little journey. And you know, I caught something that I'd never caught before. I, I catch like 20 to 50 things, maybe 100 things sometimes on every trip through. And how many times right now is not important, but it's a bunch. And I noticed this phrase in Job chapter 1 that was continually repeated. Remember when people kept giving him bad news? It says this. And another came and said. And another came and said. And another came and said. And I mean, it was just another one coming and saying stuff. And was none of it good. Lost his family. Lost his finances. Lost his flesh. And lost his friends. But he never lost his faith. He never lost his faith. And I'm going to tell you something about the fiery trial, which is to trial you. Trials operate, we'll use a, a fancy terminology here, cyclically. Meaning by that, they come in cycles. Trials operate in a circular motion, in a, in a, in a lunar motion in your life. Here's what I mean by that. If you are in a trial right now, and some of you are. And we weep with those that weep, and we laugh with those that laugh. We dance with those that dance, but we, we love those that are going through difficulty. Listen, here's how I know that Job is the Word of God. Because did you know if you're in a, in a situation right now of persecution or just whatever it may be, if, if you are in a situation right now where the heat's been turned up, I don't care what it is, in your marriage, with your kids, with your body, listen, did you know that there's only one of four areas where it's happening? Just like Job. Every trial you will ever walk through will be in one of four areas. And it will come at different times and usually it will come in a cycle. Your trial is either with your flesh, with your friends, with your finances, or with your family. That's it. That's it. That's it. Either your flesh is messed up, your family's messed up, your friends are messed up, or your money's messed up. Those are the only areas. You say, well, what, what if it's like uh, car trouble? Your money's messed up. Okay, it's, your, it's, it's an attack on your finances. If your house burns down, that's an attack on your finances. Your friends turn on you. People get mad. People leave the church. That's an attack on your friends. Your, your husband, your wife start getting crazy, start getting edgy, start getting mouthy, start getting nutso, schizophrenic on you. That's a family issue, right? Doctor says you got cancer. Doctor says you, you got memory loss. Doctor says, you know, whatever. You, you got gut problems. You got whatever you can imagine. You got COPD, upper respiratory infection. You got this, you got that, whatever. It, it's your flesh. You got four areas where you're messed up. Now, those are the only four. You will never face a trial in your life that does not hit one of those four areas, ever. And that's the whole 42 chapters of the book of Job. But I must remind you that although he lost those four things and did not lose his faith, when they got to the end, the Bible said God gave him twice as much as he had before. God gave him twice as much as he had before. And it was a beautiful transition when I began to see that here's a guy that said, you know what? No, no, no. We're not going to lift our hand in accusation to God. 
We're going to lift our hand in worship and glorification of God and say, Lord, you gave. Lord, you took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then God gave him kids back. The Bible says when he got them two daughters at the end, they were the most beautiful young ladies in the whole land. Do you know that? And get this. There's funny stuff in the Bible I read, and I'd be like, that's cute. You put that there, Lord. That is so funny. One of his most beautiful daughters was named Jemima. And wasn't even on a syrup bottle. <laughs> and I read through that, and I'm like, this guy, he was so blessed that the family that got mad at him and the friends that turned on him end up giving him offerings at the end of the whole book. And they're like, we're sorry. We were wrong. Just start peeling it out. Some of y'all waiting on that cash out, praise God. Then people that turn on you start bringing some Benjamins to the house. Amen. But notice, I, I do want to finish verse 15. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. So here's what he's going to say. Look, you're going to suffer, right? So when you suffer, don't suffer in stupid ways. Don't go to jail because you're a murderer or a thief. Go to jail because you stand for your convictions, right? You're going to suffer, just don't suffer wrong, is what he's saying. But here's the one that gets me. He said, don't suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. You know why some people live in a trial of affliction? Because they can't keep their mouth shut. They have to always stay up in somebody else's business, and then they're like, oh, <laughs> Christian persecution. No, you're just an idiot. You, you just need to repent and quit getting in people's business. The Bible says a man that walketh by and meddleth with somebody else's stuff is like a person that takes a dog by the ears. I, got to, I don't know what that dog is we got. It's, I, I don't know, some little poodle looking thing with Maltese it's called a Maltese that, that's what a milkshake whatever you call that thing and look I love that little dog to some degree got my limits he loves me but when she's in the room I'm non-existent so it don't matter he's the most docile uh, you know the UPS shows up he barks he acts like he's a doberman pincher but he's just a stupid little midget of a dog he's he's worthless he's absolutely worthless right but he, he's just he's so kind right I mean he's just he just he's a lap dog and I'm, I'm not a big, you know, animal lover, but I like him. He's cool. I really do. I like Whitfield. He's sweet. But every now and again, I'll get to messing with him. Listen. You grab that little dog's fluffy ears, flip them up to the pink side, and they'll stand up like two demon horns. And that, I mean, all of a sudden, I'm telling you, Jezebel starts coming up out of that dog. He starts flying around the room, head spinning around, acting crazy. Take a dog by the ears. It can be the nicest one and see if that dog don't turn on you. Here's what God said. It's like taking a dog by the ears when you mess in business that ain't your business. And there's a lot of people in the church world that get in people's business and then cry foul. Uh, I'm under such persecution. No, you just don't need a Facebook page. Right? No, I'm just talking. Praise God. So, I, look, we're all going to suffer. Just don't suffer for dumb stuff. Don't, don't suffer because you're mean. Don't suffer because you're a, a jerk. Don't suffer because you're, you, you hate people. Don't suffer because you're a gossip. You're gonna, those things are going to bring about suffering you don't need. Levels of suffering you don't have to have. But watch this. He's going to change in verse 16. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, capital C, Christian. So you're going to suffer. So you can suffer wrong or you can suffer right. But you're going to suffer. It's like this. You're going to die. You can die wrong or you can die right. Here's what I tell atheists all the time. Atheist friends. I try to be kind to them. I'm like, look, let me tell you something, Skippy. If I am wrong about my belief system, I lived a good life. I helped a boatload of people. Blessed folks, tried to live honorably, humble, kind. So, if my belief system's wrong, when I die, I lived a decent life. 
And I got nothing to lose because I'm just going to go on the ground and ain't going to remember nothing. But if your belief system's wrong, you wasted your whole life fighting something you're going to meet when you die and you're in big trouble with God. So you're going to die. Make sure you die right. And let me lovingly, in a shepherdly fashion, tell you, you will never die right if you don't live right. That's the facts. So he said, look, you're going to suffer. So don't suffer as a busybody. Don't suffer as a telephone gossip. Don't, don't suffer as a mean person, as a murderer, as a thief. Don't, don't suffer that way. If you're going to suffer, suffer as a Christian. Watch this. Let him not be ashamed. You notice sometimes we go through trials, we're like ashamed of it. We're like, well, I don't want to tell anybody I'm going through difficulty because they might think it's chastisement. No, no, no. The Bible says when you're going through difficulty, don't be ashamed of it. God's growing you. God's entrusted you with something he didn't entrust me with. God's helping you. God's maturing you. That's what growth is. And, and growth hurts, right? Them growth pains hurt. But he says, don't be ashamed. Watch this. Last phrase. But let him, watch this, glorify God on this behalf. On what behalf? That everything's wonderful and rosy and all your bills are paid? No. You glorify God on the behalf of the fact that the glory of God is producing suffering in your life. And the suffering is going to produce resurrection. It's going to produce resurrection. So, it wasn't the message on the glory of God that I had originally intended on speaking. But that silly plastic fork got me last night when I was eating. And I said, honey, I got, I, I, I'm going to have to give this illustration. I, thought, I said, I think I'm going to do it tomorrow night. And here we are, burning plastic forks in church. <laughs> Some of you are in a situation right now that you don't quite understand, and that's okay. Let the fiery trial increase your fire. You see, the reason the fire around the three Hebrew children did not burn them up is because the fire on the inside was burning brighter than the fire on the outside. <laughs> so don't let it destroy you. Let it inflame you. Don't let it melt you down. Don't let it make you become bitter. If Peter is saying anything, and we pray, he's saying this. Don't allow the fiery trial which is to try you to make you bitter. Allow it to grow you better. You see, bitterness and betterness, if there's such a word, are two very different tracks that you take in life. I want to be better because of my trials. Not bitter because of them. And I'm going to tell you what happens. I know I said I'm going to stop and I am. I'm going to tell you what happens in the process of trials when you get bitter. When God's trying to teach you a lesson and he's clearly trying to teach you all of us something in this room tonight. And there's some of you, you're like, oh my goodness, he, is he like listening at me through my alarm clock and the house? I mean, whatever, okay? But here's what you need to understand. All of us in this room are going through various levels of difficulty, right? But at the end of the day, there is one purpose for your pain. Romans 8, 28. He says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God. Ultimately, to the conforming of the image of his son. You see, God will do things in your life to make you stop looking like you and make you start looking like him. But notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that all things in your life are good. It said all things work together for good. There's some things that, let's just be honest, they're not good. But they work together for good. I'm not a cook. Don't claim to be and don't want to be. But I want you to think about something just for a moment. Just hit me so I'm going to say it. 
in the best explanation of Romans 8, 28 and 29. I am not going to eat a stick of butter by itself. I like butter, but I like it on something. Okay? I'm not going to eat a stick of butter. I'm not going to eat a, a cup of baking soda. You know, old timers can brush their teeth with it all they want to. I ain't going to do it. I ain't eating baking soda by itself. I'm not going to eat a tablespoon of salt. And I know I'm probably not getting all the pieces right. But nonetheless, I'm not, I'm not going to eat a, a tablespoon of salt. I'm just, I'm just not. I, I'm not going to in and of themselves eat that stuff. Not going to get butter, cram it in my mouth. Not going to get salt, cram it in my mouth. Not going to get baking soda, cram it in my mouth. Just not. I, I'm not going to get raw eggs because I ain't getting salmonella, or whatever you call it, right? I'm not going to be drinking down no raw eggs. Rrr, look at my mouth. Uh-uh. I get some muscle, some muscle. I ain't eating raw eggs. But listen. I could take them same raw eggs that by themselves are not good. That same baking soda, which by itself is not good. That same butter, which by itself is not good, although it is pretty good. And that same salt, which by itself is not good. I can take them same things that by themselves are not good, put them in a bowl, mix them all up, throw them in the oven, have cat head biscuits in 45 minutes, and that's real good. Real good. You see, the individual ingredients that you face are not good. But when they're thrown into the mixing bowl of God's sovereign plan for your life, they become very good. So some of you need to hold on a little bit longer in your trial of affliction because God may just be making some biscuits out of you. Amen, church. I want you to stand to your feet for a moment. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes all over the room. Everybody online has been watching. I I pray it's been a blessing to you, all of our hubs. I don't know what you're going through. I don't have to know. Other people don't know and maybe don't have to know. And it's good to share our burdens one with another. But I wonder tonight if one, two, ten, fifty, I don't know. Some people in this room tonight, you're just like, wow, I know why God gave you that plastic fork. Because I really needed this tonight from the Lord. And the Lord has moved on my spirit. The Lord has moved in my mind, in my heart, in my presence tonight. And pastor, I want you to know that if nobody in this room received a word, God gave me one through his word. And tonight the spirit of God has spoken to me deeply. About maybe one, two, ten. I don't know what levels. But whatever it is, would you slip your hand up all over the room right now? Some folks are just beginning to come. Hands everywhere. Hands. Listen, I, I can't see that many hands and not give you a chance to strike while the iron's hot. Just come for a moment. Come for a moment. Come for a moment. We got, we got something special we're going to dismiss with here in just a few moments. But right now, this is a time of very special nature. What are you, what are you, what are you going through? What are you facing? What are you dealing with? God's got some of you in a, in a time of transition. He's got some of you in a time of of not knowing what's next. He's got some of you in a a time of really seeking the Lord. And, And I just feel led to tell some of you, look, the fear of man brings a snare. Don't fear the fallout. Don't fear what somebody's going to think when you tell them what you're facing or what you're dealing with or what you need. Just trust the Lord. God's not giving you that spirit of fear but of love, power, and a sound mind. Let Him take you to the next level. And so often to be taken to the next level, we've got to get low before the Lord. We've got to get low before the Lord. I know our men are security team praying over someone tonight. It's requested prayer. It's beautiful to see. Beautiful to see. Get what you need from the Lord. Don't miss it. Trial of affliction. It's part of life. It's painful. It's part of the process. We've all got to deal with it. We've all been there. Some of you are there right now. And we're cheering you on. We're believing God for your breakthrough and your victory. You know, we hear a lot about breakthrough, and it's a great word. It's a great principle. But I want to tell you something about breakthrough. Nine times out of ten, if not ten times out of ten, Your breakthrough will arrive after the breakdown. Because you see, the breakdown 
is what God's using to tee you up for the breakthrough. Because you wouldn't appreciate the breakthrough without the breakdown. That's not fun. I get it. It's not fun. There are some of you in this room that have experienced things I've never yet to experience. Vice versa. That's the beautiful thing about the body of Christ. Each member of the body hurts in different ways, but we're all still part of the same body and we serve each other and we love each other and we cry with each other and we dance with each other and we rejoice with each other. We rise and we fall together. Continue to pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Looks like Sunday up here, all these people seeking the Lord. Just take your time. It's beautiful. Bible says be still but being still and being stopped are not the same thing you can still do what you know God's called you to do and move in the way God's called you to move but he says look let your spirit be still don't be full of anxiety don't fret don't worry bend don't break burn don't melt Keep praying. Whether you're praying or whether you're still standing or kneeling or wherever you're at, I'm going to tell you something. And some of you tonight, this is the only part of the message you need to hear. Psalm 30 and verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You know what's beautiful about tomorrow morning? No matter what you're facing tonight, the sun will shine again. It will shine again. No matter what hurt you faced, no matter what tragedy you faced, the sun will shine again. That is a fact. It's a fact. Hallelujah. He's in a good church. And guess what? And when things aren't good, God still is. <laughs> when things aren't good, God still is. It doesn't change. I remember years ago, I think I've quoted this before. We're about to transition into something else, but I want to say this. I remember years ago, I, I used to write a lot of poetry. I know everybody from YouTube thinks it's rap songs, but I wrote a lot of poetry. And if I can remember it correctly, one of the first poems I ever wrote when I started preaching it, it, it goes something like this. My troubles have come and my troubles have gone and more trouble is on the way. One thing is for sure, my troubles endure for my trouble will meet me today. So often I've tried just simply to hide my face from its long gazing stare, yet running my best from east to the west, I find that my trouble's still there. From dusk until dawn, my troubles roll on and it seems that my troubles won't end. But then as I look in the words of God's book, I find there that troubles my friend. And God has never given you trouble to hurt you, but only to help you and only to grow you. And so as your shepherd, as your pastor, look, if there's anything we can do to pray, to weep with you, to help you, to counsel you, reach out. We're a family. We love each other. 
There are people in this room that deeply are hurting, have deep sicknesses and diseases and problems in their marriage and financial instabilities. I get it. We're going to need each other moving forward more than we've ever needed each other before. We're going to need each other deeply, deeply, deeply. Well, here's what we're going to do tonight for just a moment. We're going to, we're going to close in a, in a beautiful way, in, a, in, an, in an unusual way. But really, we do a lot of things around here that aren't that unusual. If you're done praying, I'm just going to ask that you go ahead and start heading back to your seat. I'm, just, I'm going to need this middle section on the floor here just for a moment. How many years are we looking at? 19. Yeah, 20. Oh, 20 seconds. Okay. So tonight we have a vow renewal by request. And they've been working on this for a little while. And they said, could we do this with our church family on a Wednesday night? And I said, absolutely you can. So, what did he run off to? Oh, he getting dressed. He getting the he getting the duds on. All right, I got anybody up here to help me sing something real quick? Are we good? How long is he gonna need? Y'all, y'all don't have to stand up. By the way, you can you can sit down. Two minutes. Oh, we're good. We're good. So we're gonna do a vow renewal tonight. If you don't know what a vow renewal is, it's just basically people who are married. Then it doesn't mean it's not happily married. They just said, you know what? We want to, before God and before our church family, make a recommitment of what we've already committed to. It's a beautiful thing. I, I've been in services where there were a hundred plus couples that did an, an out loud vow renewal all at one time. We, we've talked about having a whole vow renewal you know, type services here at the church. And I think it's powerful. I think it's very reviving. And if nothing else, it, it shows us in the room the, the power and the importance of a covenant before the Lord. And the Bible says, they too shall be what? One flesh. Not, not two. Here's what's interesting. Now, I'm, 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 I'm glad he's a minute or so behind because I want to preach on something that's important. Okay? Let me tell you something. Did you know... <laughs> this is interesting. That Adam is the one that named his wife. You know that? Adam named her Eve the mother of all living. Do you know what God named them? Adam. It says, and God named them Adam. But Adam named her Eve. You see, to us, it's a split. Two people. To God, it's one. It's a beautiful picture of Christ and His church. We are the bride. He is the groom. We are at one with Him. And let me tell you something about marriage. The goal and the purpose of your marriage is not unity. It's oneness. It's oneness. They too shall be one flesh this is a great mystery he said but I speak and preach Paul said in Ephesians 5 as concerning Christ and his church Job you ever wonder why in all those trials the devil killed everybody but his wife because you remember what God said to Job you can kill them all but you can't kill Job you know what the devil knew theologically well, that means I can't mess with Miss Job either because they're the same person in God's eyes they too shall be one flesh is he getting his tennis shoes on and running or is he getting his clothes on praise God amen All right, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to come up here okay let me also have the the ring bearing friends the ring bearing people ah here we go with this rosy man right here amen let me get you guys to stand right here in front of me Regina you sit on this side Look at them britches right there. Praise God. Yes, sir. Yes. If you had a chef hat, I'd buy some food off you right now. Praise God. <laughs> well, why don't we begin with a word of prayer tonight? Just ask the Lord to continue to bless this family. They've, they've been so faithful to our church. And 
stuck it out here when everybody tried to get them to leave and all of that, and they've, they've, they've stayed with it. So I'm going to ask if you guys would join hands. I'm going to pray over you as your pastor, and then we're going to go into a time of just a recommitments before the Lord. It would seem like a, a very simplistic, very uh, normal wedding ceremony. I'm going to let them do some vows. They'll swap some rings. Father, we thank you for this man and this woman. Thank you for their children. Thank you for their family. Thank you for, most of all, their faith, their resilience, their courage, their testimony. And their desire to recommit before you, which no doubt they've done, but before we, their church family, we honor them for this. And we thank you for Jason. We thank you for Regina. We thank you for how you have so deeply involved yourself in their life. Lord, so many of us remember that really they shouldn't even be here. Great whirlwind came and took everything they had away, but they bent, they didn't break. And I thank you for that. We honor the man and woman of God for that tonight. So bless their family wonderfully in these last days, more even so than the first. Bless them. Bless them in the name of Jesus and the church gladly shout it out. All right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to begin with you, sir. I'm going to ask you a series of questions that you don't even have to answer until I get them to the end. Then I'm going to turn to you, and then we'll swap the rings, and then I'm going to let you do the vows that you've come up with. Do you, Jason, promise to love Regina with a biblical, God-like love? Do you promise to support her, protect her, adore her? And give yourself once and again solely and completely to her before these witnesses tonight. <laughs> Do you, Regina, promise to love Jason with a biblical, godlike love? Do you promise to support him, to protect him, to adore him? And give yourself once again solely and completely to him tonight before these witnesses. If I can have the rings, please. upon her finger and as you do repeat after me with this ring I thee wed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit alright Miss Regina if you take that slip that upon his ring finger and as you do just simply repeat after me with this ring I thee wed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit alright now you guys each have vows that you want to share or something that you would like to say. Normally this would be a part that I would read through, but they said, no, we've got, we've got our own deal. And she has hers, and he's going to wing it. So pray for us, praise God. Amen. <laughs> but I'm going to begin with you, sir. If you just speak to your bride. a battle that we had gone through to be where we're at now. I promise from this day forward to protect you no matter what. Whether we're standing there being martyrs for Jesus, I'll be there. The second coming, Jesus comes back, I'll be there. I love you forever and always. Dear Jason, as I stand before you once again in the presence of the Lord to renew our commitment vows to one another, I'm taken back to May the 22nd, 2004, when I first said I do. As I think back to the 18-year-old me fresh out of high school, I'm reminded of my thoughts at that time. Here is this nice looking guy who has asked me to spend the rest of my life with him. I felt wanted by a guy for the first time. I want to apologize to you, but most importantly to the Lord 
for going into it with such a low reverence of the meaning of what I vowed. The first 10 years was such, I mean, the first 10 years was boot camp with the enemy as our captain. In the many battles of trauma, I never knew what love was, nor did I realize my worth. I only knew that if I showed you enough love, that you would be able to love me. No matter how hard I tried, I had no voice and was a doormat. I was to it was toxic to me, but it was also toxic to you because I ripped away your responsibility in being the husband that God called you to be. I want to say that I'm sorry to you and to the Lord that I never saw my worth and spoke up when I should have as your help me. In 2015, the Lord led us to a seven month separation. As we were going down a dark road to death, I will never forget the day I surrendered my life to him in my mom's driveway. The Lord revealed to me that the love I was looking for in you, I was only going to find in him. That night, I accepted that love and knew at that moment he was going to teach me how to properly love you and what my role was as your wife. As the Lord led us back to together, two weeks later, we walk into this church. I want to thank Pastor Greg for his role in our new life together, as he was a conduit of the Lord to teach me what biblical marriage looks like, what my role as your wife is. I committed for the last nine and a half years to learn everything I could as the role of a wife, the roles of a husband, and what a marriage is in the eyes of the Lord, and how I am to fight for our marriage and our family in the spiritual realm. Thank you, Pastor Greg, for being a godly example of a true husband with a fear of the Lord and a representation by the way you loved high and serve her in the same way that Jason is to love and serve me. I want to thank Pastor Ty for being a godly wife as an example to show me how I am to love you, Jason, and fight the devil tooth and nail in the spiritual. So here we are 20 years later. Jason Cook, I love you so dearly. Tonight, as we rededicate our vows, I now can say I truly know what a marriage covenant and vow means, what my role is in this marriage, as well as <coughs> what your role is as my husband. I have always known that I love you, but from this day forward, I promise to learn how to fall in love with you. I promise to never give up on you. I promise to continue to fight for this marriage spiritually and biblically. I promise to do everything I can to be the wife the Lord has called me to be. I promise to build you up and not tear you down. I promise to support and encourage you. I promise to, I promise to forever push you closer and closer to the Lord. With that being said, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the presence and ask you to forgive our, irrever our irreverence to your covenant of marriage in May the 22nd, 2004. Tonight, on May 15th, 2024, in your presence, Lord, we commit our marriage to you. Yes. We commit to allowing you to be the leader and us as your servants. We ask that you lead this marriage as a proper example to our daughters of what a godly marriage looks like and for them not to settle for anything less. We want to see your face, Lord. Consume our inner beings and burn up the chaff. Fortify our faith and help in areas of our unbelief. Lord, we want to be your glory carriers, hosting your glory and your presence in our home and wherever we go. Show your Shekinah glory in our marriage, Lord. Yes. We want your kavod, your weighty presence. We want to encounter you, Lord, on a new level in our marriage. We want to encounter the true intimacy of Jesus so that it can over, so it can flow into our marriage. Increase our intimacy, Lord, for one another. We want to see your face, Lord, and know your heart, yes. and know the heart of the Lord. Pour your love over us until we overflow. Mm. Tonight, we give you our yes. Pour out your predestined love into Jason. I feel you have told me that this love will be my healing. Pour out your living water upon us. We want to continue to set in the overflow of your presence. We want to encounter you as our healer. We surrender this marriage to you, Lord. Stir the waters, Lord. Pour your oil upon us from the throne room of heaven. 
And as Pastor Ty taught, fill us until we overflow. Yes. I plead 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 over our marriage. Love yes. suffers long and is kind. Mm. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Mm. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Mm. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, mm. but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. We surrender ourselves and this marriage to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yes, that ought to convict all of us. That made my job easy tonight. Well, I want everybody to stand up all over this room because of the power invested in me by Almighty God, the Word of God, and the great state of Tennessee. I get to now pronounce you once again, husband and wife. You may kiss your bride. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. Let it be a lesson to all of us. We love you guys. We'll see you this weekend. God bless you. Get around. Love on each other like a big family tonight.